They are roughly equal in regards to north-south, <laughs> so I don't think there's any cheating there. Okay. Now, this isn't going to go to a court of law or anything. <laughs> You've got to be careful with these Americans. <laughs> I admit it. I cheated. Yup, right at the very beginning, on day five. I'm attempting to walk the entire length of New Zealand on the Te Araroa, a through-hike that should take me five months to complete. And I've already skipped a section. But let's be fair. Everyone cheats at least a little on this massive trail. One that's less an actual trail than an idea. And the part I skipped is all on road. I'm Allison Young, and this is The P-Rag, Unfiltered Adventures of the Blissful Hiker. I am the Blissful Hiker, sometime professional flutist, sometime voice artist, and full-time pedestrian. Every week I share with you what it's like on the trail, why anyone would want to walk that far, and while it may not be a glamorous life, why it's one of the most fulfilling. A big shout-out to Lecky Trekking Poles for supporting the P-Rag podcast. If you want to be a blissful hiker, Lecky's should be in your hands. By going. You're not making any progress south in a southward direction. through. Does it count if cheating wasn't my idea? I'm staying with a friend of a friend of a friend, a lovely retired doctor who is beloved up here in the far, far north. Peter's home overlooks Ahipara Bay, and it was a quiet evening, just for two, drinking wine under the olive trees, my tent the alley coop drying on his lush lawn in between rain showers, a pork belly dinner, lots of conversation, and finally singing for one another. Fati fati taku pene. He wondered last night if I'd betray the mission by having him drive me to the next town, because the Te Araroa Trust had to divert the trail onto nearly 28 kilometers, or 17 miles, of hot tarmac, five kilometers of which they suggest, or rather require, the hiker hitch a ride, because it's all just too dangerous to walk on road. Other issues have intruded, too, like I already need to resupply at the store in the next town, Kaitaya. And Irene, my Kiwi friend, the one who brought me from the airport to the start of the trail and with whom I've walked with so far, already hitched a ride to town. If I insist on being resolute in walking this section, in big air quotes, I'd likely be walking all on my own. A bit of background here. The route has been diverted because the first of four Northland forests have been closed. The reason is the trees are dying. Cowries are massive conifers with a girth to rival American sequoias. They're ancient, dating back to the Jurassic period, with a beautiful flaky bark that hinders parasitic plants and massive branches, though tiny leaves, but they dominate the forest canopy. For this dendrologist wannabe, tree enthusiast, cowries are magnificent. So it's with great sorrow that they're being brought down by a microscopic fungus. Phytophthora agathidacida, or cowrie dieback, moves through soil from tree to tree carried on the bottom of a tramper's shoes. It only takes a pinhead's worth to spread the fungus. So why take a chance? The Harakino Forest is closed to everyone, yet the Ratea Forest is still open. And that's where we're headed this morning in Peter's Range Rover. He throws my pack in the boot, then heaves his own pack in after lacing up boots, planning to join us for at least the first few hours in completely new terrain. The road is narrow and winding as we head inland, away from the blowing sand on 90 Mile Beach, and in towards vivid green pasture land, cows lining up on the verge to cross when there's a break in traffic. Kiwis drive fast and always seem delighted to be out in their beautiful country. Peter shouting over the whine of the SUV to point out a marae or meeting house of local Maori. The 90-mile beach felt deserted, remote, and lonely. 
It's not an understatement to say I feel culture shock pulling into this massive parking lot of an equally massive box store called Pack and Save, just to pick up a few items for the coming days. Peter grabs his own trolley as we synchronize shop, the bulk sections of nuts and candy as delightfully decadent as walking into Willy Wonka's factory. We settle up and get moving again to pick up Irene at her friend's house, and Peter tells me with a grin that the shopkeepers gave him a bit of a sideways look, wondering who his young woman friend is shopping so early on a Saturday morning. Ha! Let him talk. We find Irene high up on a hill, a cluster of homes nestled in with a few barnyard creatures roaming about, and views to the surrounding mountains. I'm so glad we'll continue together, as she tells me that Amelia and Jean-Christophe kept walking on the road after the beach and are now a full day ahead. We bump and lurch up the Takahue Saddle Road to the Mangamuka route. The air is cool and fresh, the smell so different now sweetly pungent, earthy, and well, moist. Um, yeah, at the start of the trek, uh, we saw the mamaku, or the black tree fern. Beautiful rimu and... Um, puri- Peter names the plants as we pass them on what is more a four-wheel drive road than trail, wide enough that we can all walk abreast. The light is dappled in a checkered pattern through massive tree ferns, with fiddleheads larger than my fist. We pass driveways with curious metal gates decorated with masks, sculptures, and keep-out signs. It's easy walking slowly uphill, and we talk the entire way before Peter slows down to tell us he's heading back now. It kind of seems arbitrary to me, since it's still early and the going's really good. But then he points to my left, to a tiny opening in the thick foliage. That's the way? In there? It's a trail about a meter wide. People have been here recently, I see, and have left footprints squished into deep mud already filled with coffee-colored water. They trail off and are lost in the bush, the track no longer a gradually ascending road on long switchbacks, but rather one aggressively cutting up the mountain now, straight up. You're listening to The P-Rag, Unfiltered Adventures of The Blissful Hiker. I'm Allison Young, The Blissful Hiker, and it's day five of my epic long-distance walk of the Te Araroa, New Zealand's long pathway. If you're enjoying the storytelling, leave a comment at Apple Podcasts. That's the way other people can find The P-Rag. And a big thank you to Lecky for their support of the show. Lecky's held me up and kept me going across two countries. If you want to be a blissful hiker... Leckies should be in your hands. In the coming weeks, I'll have a drawing for a new pair of Lecky trekking poles. I'll base it on the best comment left on Apple Podcasts. So keep listening and be sure to subscribe and comment on the show. Up until this point in the day, my Leckies were pretty much window dressing. The trail, if you could call it a trail, was really more of a road or forest track. What Irene and I were walking on now was the opposite extreme, and it gave a whole new meaning to the term tramping track. Ooh, water right down the back of the shoe. The mud is thick and sticky, wet and slippery. Roots crisscross the path, and I learn quickly not to try and balance on them as a means to avoid the mud, because they're worse than the mud. They're kind of greasy and unstable. The bush presses in on us in a fecund jungle, not allowing any sidestepping of the thickest patches of mud. And it's not just up, but down and then back up again. No views at all giving us even the least hint where we are. The truth is, there's only one way to get through, and that's to simply plunge directly through it. I know there's a lesson hidden in this moment, one about persevering and pressing forward, facing obstacles straight on. But at this point, the sun streaming through and a friend bonding over slip-and-slide squishiness with me, I'm having fun. 
In the first minutes, I'm muddy up to my knees, the soft muck oozing through my running shoes, the rainwater cooling my feet. And Irene just keeps nattering away the entire time, since we dare not split up in this thick maze. She reminds me of Hiker B, my friend Brenda, who hiked with me on similarly rough conditions one rainy fall on the border route trail in northern Minnesota. We saw practically no one in that wet, overgrown wilderness, but we saw loads of tracks from resident creatures. Moose, bear, wolf. Though never having the chance to actually see them, since they could hear us coming from miles away. I clean it up. This forest, too, is thick with blowdown and mud, uphill and down and up again to Mangamuke Saddle. Slip and slide is all fun and games until you're hauling up a fully resupplied pack straight uphill in it. Hiker B often would say she longed for just a hundred feet of joy. Here it's more like a meter of joy here and a meter of joy there. And you never really want to take your eyes off where you're putting your feet. My leckies save me from a muddy bum. And I walk with an animal gait, reaching forward and sort of crawling through. We take one brief look at a little view of bush-covered mountains undulating towards the horizon. Then we're right back in towards the summit and radio towers, a sign telling us they're one minute off the trail. It's too early to camp, but what a perfect blanket of grass in the sun. It's tomato soup and Hungarian salami for lunch, neither of us feeling particularly eager to move on. The trail goes up and down and up again, I think I already said that, didn't I? That's why they say you can only go one kilometer an hour. The fun, you know, it's kind of wearing off a little. It's getting tiring, and it's getting late. Camping by a river tonight and a chance to rinse off this mud? That's a long way off. Irene and I are quiet in our thoughts as we keep walking. And then she stops and says, A tui. It's not that I hadn't noticed the birds until now. There was a pretty steady racket of birds. But I was so focused on the mud, my eyes and ears aimed down, it took Irene's pointing out this fanciful creature for me to stop and listen. A tui is a passerine or perching bird. Their plumage is an oily purple and blue, but from my vantage, this one appeared all black, except for a tuft of white at its throat. Kind of like a minister, it waddled and throbbed as he would sing. But is sing the correct term? I hear bell-like sounds amidst clicks, cackles, creaks, groans, and wheezes. More like R2-D2 than any bird I'd ever heard before. I learn later that tuis can sound like two birds because of their bifurcated sound-producing organ called a syrinx. Our tui would let the silence grow in anticipation, then sing a song so loud like he'd never heard of using his inside voice. He follows us for a few steps before I say goodbye, and Irene assures me I'd hear more and many, like parrots, mimicking precisely voices and sounds, sometimes to the utter annoyance of anyone close by. The trail plays tricks on me. Blue sky opens up and a summit appears near, but then the orange triangles point down, then around. I bring three liters of water to last the day with the intention of making it to a lovely stream just beyond the forest, but the afternoon gives way and the light begins to change, warming to a deep orange the tall rimu covered in Dr. Seussian epicytes and long black tenderly supplejack. This has got to be the hardest trail I've walked, and this is not my first rodeo. Epic Mud and I have been personally acquainted in Peru's Vilcabamba, Chile's Torres del Paine, and England's Pennines. But this is a combination of all three on steroids. A turn you around on trail, massive overgrowth, suck off your shoe kind of mud, 
obscure the tripping hazards giant ferns you'd ever seen, and most of it on a slope. It begins to occur to me that we've been far too laid back about the day. Lingering over breakfast, strolling through the pack and save, sauntering with Peter up the first part while he identified trees, and finally lounging by the radio towers for a long, leisurely lunch. It's all left us far behind schedule. Not that I'm much of a scheduled kind of backpacker, but there is no flat space, let alone clear space, to set our tents. And even though it doesn't seem that way today, this is a rainforest. We need to be under some sort of shelter, and here is nothing but a wisp of a trail marked by a series of orange triangles hammered to trees. In the dark, there's no telling where the trail goes. Later in my hike, I hear of a solo female hiker who got so turned around in the Ratea forest, she just kept walking and walking after dark, fell down a waterfall, and somehow not only managed to survive the fall, but managed just enough cell service to call for help. I thankfully have my GPS, but under so much tree cover, the reception is spotty. We go up and up and come to a wide spot in the trail where it appears another trail joins in. A wooden sign points one way to McKinney Road and the other way, T.A. Sobo, or Southbound, with these encouraging words. Only 2,850 kilometers to go. <laughs> well, it's not really flat enough to pitch on all these routes. We both use an oddly named crowdsourced trail app on our phones called Guthook, one that most through hikers use instead of paper maps, something practically useless in this clag. An entry from a recent hiker tells us there is a spot to camp just below the summit. Is this the summit, I wonder? The description goes on and is even more vague. A grassy area with some flat spots for a tent or two between kilometer mark 148 and 150. Considering we've been averaging one kilometer per hour, that's some spread. We press on, knowing we'll have to spend the night in this forest, and no matter what, it's got to be that grassy area. But as we pass what we think might be the summit, the trail comes to a dead end, its blowdown in a tangled mass. We climb over, hugging a steep ridge, until the trail completely peters out. This doesn't feel right, Irene says, checking her app to see if there's any indication of the right way. Let's go back to that blowdown and just see. <laughs> That's the best idea of the day, because just beyond the blowdown, hidden by branches and ferns fanning out, is an orange triangle pointing down. What we were walking on is called a herd trail. Everyone made the same mistake. And you get enough people walking that way, the wrong way begins to look like the right way. So we broke out of the pack and head down, where instantly the real trail becomes more obvious. We're going down, I tell Irene, who gives me this no shit look. Down doesn't take your breath away, but it's slippery and it's hard to negotiate. On and on we go, down and down, over roots and through mud, as the sun begins to disappear and the air cools. What about this day, I think? What has it taught me? To just plow through the tough parts and not care if you get dirty. To never assume. And to look and listen for all the beauty around you, even if you're tired and uncertain you'll find a flat place to camp. I mean, that's the wonder of hiking, that you really, truly have to let go of expectations, of being hard on yourself, of having to do things in the right way, because sometimes the day just gets away from you and you have to improvise. I'm tired. I'm ready to stop. And just as I think that, I notice there's grass under my feet. The trail suddenly widens slightly into a small, flat area, no bigger than the width 
of a tent. We're here! No water, no view, nothing to write home about. But it's perfect for our two single tents, set one after another, nearly blocking the trail. The alley coop is up fast, and I set about peeling off my muddy clothes and using every disposable wipe in my arsenal to clean myself so I can crawl inside my tent. Dinner is a luxury, though quick, as Irene and I share her rain cape as a seat. Just then, two hikers crash out of the bush, their headlamps lighting up the gloaming. Rowan and Rebecca arrive, newlyweds, who thought hiking nearly 2,000 miles might be a good way to start a marriage. They charm us with their English accents and understated style, too restrained to ever admit they thought they'd never get out of the forest tonight. Tuis and birds exotic to my ears pipe up as we all begin to settle in for the night. Rowan chatters on with energy and self-assuredness of a man on his honeymoon. He brags about the number of sweets they carry and how many they eat per day, which instantly makes me feel better, since through hiking brings out the candy grabber in me. And before long, the night goes pitch black and we all fall asleep to a jumbled melody of Ratea Forest's wild lullaby. The P-Rag is supported by Lecky trekking poles. If you want to be a blissful hiker, Lecky's should be in your hands. You can subscribe to the show at theprag.com, Apple or Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And if you're listening on Apple, take a moment to leave a review. That will help others discover the P-Rag. And soon you'll have a chance to win your very own Lecky trekking poles. I'll have a contest for the most creative Apple podcast comment. So subscribe, rate, and most importantly, comment. Again, that's at Apple Podcasts to win your very own Lecky trekking poles. And the flute music you're listening to, I completely forget to identify it each time. It is me playing with my friend Vicki Selden. You can find out more about the music, read a transcript, and of course subscribe. Just go to theprag.com. Until next week on the P-Rag, when we'll push through more forest all the way to the Pacific Ocean and the Bay of Islands. Happy trails! Happy trails!